Um, well, we're very happy that everyone's here with us tonight. Uh, my name is Michelle Lantieri. I'm the Curator of Collections and Exhibitions at the Millicent Rogers Museum in Taos, New Mexico. Um, I first want to honor the Tiwa people on whose land we stand. Uh, really grateful to be able to host these programs uh, for the IAIA exhibition and also host the exhibition here at the museum. Um, this series is called Curated Conversations. Um, and it takes place in partnership with the current exhibition here at the museum. Um, the exhibition is called New Mexico Air, IAIA Artist Residence in Visual Dialogue. And we've actually reached almost the last week of it being on display here. Uh, so if you're in town or you wanna make the trip to Taos, I definitely highly recommend it. Um, the last day of the exhibition will be January 29th, um, which is a Saturday. Um, so we've been really lucky and excited to work with 10 amazing artists um, for this exhibition who've participated in the artist residency program with the Institute of American Indian Arts. Um, and the people that we've been working with are based in New Mexico. So that, that's been our focus uh, for the past several months now. Um, the exhibition is also part of the museum's New Mexico Artists series, uh, which we just launched in 2021. Um, so the exhibition has been focusing on places of home, identity construction, also cross-cultural exchanges. Um, and so these programs that we're hosting on Zoom also, you know, work with those focus areas. Um, you know, we're really thinking about intersections um, and conversations, um, just to talk about some of the concepts that the artists are using and kind of where different concepts meet up. Um, so the co-curator for the exhibition is Donning Pollen Shorty. Uh, she's of Taos Pueblo, Diné, and Lakota Heritage. Um, and so she's a figurative artist who works in micaceous clay. Uh, she's also an IAIA alumna from the Museum Studies program. Um, and she's currently an arts educator at Vista Grande High School here in Taos. Um, so I wanna express a lot of gratitude to her for co-curating this exhibition with us. Um, and now I'll introduce our two artists here tonight. Um, so Kara Romero is a contemporary fine art photographer based in Santa Fe. She's an enrolled citizen of the Chemoevi Indian tribe. And Romero was raised between contrasting settings, the rural Chemoevi reservation and the Mojave Desert in California, and also the urban sprawl of Houston, Texas. Romero's identity informs her photography, a blend of fine art and editorial photography, shaped by years of study and a visceral approach to representing indigenous and non-indigenous cultural memory, collective history, and lived experiences from a Native American female perspective. Since 1998, Romero's expansive oeuvre has been informed by formal training in film, digital, fine art, and commercial photography. By staging theatrical compositions infused with dramatic color, Romero takes on the role of storyteller using contemporary photography techniques to depict the modernity of native peoples, illuminating indigenous worldviews and aspects of supernationalism in everyday life. Welcome, Kara. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you to the Artists in Residency Program and the Millicent Rogers Museum. It's an honor to be here with both you and with Orlando, and uh, I am calling in from Santa Fe, the land of the Tewa Tewa Toa and Kara speaking peoples. Um, such an honor to be here this evening. Thank you. Thank you for being here with us. Orlando Dugay is a Diné fashion designer also based in Santa Fe. He draws inspiration from his childhood memories of stargazing in the desert of Northern Arizona, while spending summer vacations on his paternal grandparents' sheep ranch. The stars hold deep meaning to the Diné people, songs and prayers passed down through generations of, ast of astronomical knowledge. This coupled with the phrase, walk in beauty, is a way of being in harmony with all that's around you, a state of grace. This is the artist's foundation for his work. He is committed to making ornamented garments made by hand that have always been part of Navajo culture. Dugay is committed to continuing these traditions and sharing them with women through fashion. Thank you so much for being here, Orlando. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Yat eto yahet to you, Michelle, and the Millicent Rogers Museum and um, the Artist in Residency Program from IAIA. Thank you. And um, 
hello to Kara as well and um, sending out um, uh, some good um, wishes, I guess, to, um, to Wayne um, Gassan and, uh, and, and their family, the Gassan family. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being here with us. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen here uh, with you. So let me go ahead and, and get some graphics going so we can first talk about um, some of the works in the exhibition. Okay. And we're very grateful to the Institute of American Indian Arts and New Mexico Arts uh, for their support of both the exhibition and the Zoom programs and all of the associated programs that we've been able to do. Okay, so let's see. All right. Um, so here are two works um, that are in the exhibition, um, both very striking pieces. Um, and so I was hoping uh, that we could just kind of start off uh, with both of you talking about these works and your concepts kind of leading up to their final form and maybe even, you know, how they've kind of moved in different exhibitions. Um, Kara, would you like to start with your work? So the piece that everyone is looking at on the left is called Hermosa, and it was captured during a three-month residency um, in the Los Angeles area uh, on Hermosa Beach. So it was um, in one part a homecoming to the place that I was born, um, and Los Angeles is also a place of creation for many Southern California tribes. Um, underneath that industrial empire is a holy place. I was commissioned by the Indian Collective in 2021 um, to create a billboard series, uh, a public art series to bring um, critical visibility to Southern California tribes and peoples. And so while I was there, um, I worked with the local Tongva nation, um, sometimes called Gabrielino or Keech Nation as well, um, to create that billboard series and then simultaneously made work um, with my daughter and with my best friend because we were working in quarantine. Um, and so uh, in order to get through that part of the pandemic, I took my whole pod with me. Um, out to uh, the Los Angeles area. And my daughter and I worked together intensely for about a month um, with uh, the incredible artistry of Leah Matafrawa, who is a celebrated regalia maker of coastal peoples in California. Um, so Cricket is wearing um, the regalia of uh, Southern California coastal tribes with um, a cottonwood bark skirt, uh, a belt, and then of course shells from the area. We went out uh, onto the beach um, doing a study um, day after day and this um, wave came up and crashed um, during one of our shoots prior to her even being able to react. And uh, I was using strobe lights and was able to capture um, capture everything. So this piece um, is near and dear to heart, and uh, that's uh, invokes a sense of um, Chimwevi creation mythos. Um, we come from this area, and our creator is Great Ocean Woman. Thank you. And um, could you talk a little bit about the black and white choosing that aesthetic for this image? Hmm. Um, I typically work with color last in my process and um, I just felt that it was um, really strong um, and really uh, just you know, brought a sense, um, an emotional sense to the piece that I, I loved. Thank you. Thank you for sharing with everyone. And Orlando, can you tell us about the concepts that you were working with for the Alice dress and 
kind of, you know, how you've seen it move through um, different places? Yeah, so um, this is um, part of a collection that I did um, last year. And um, this dress was actually in the works for uh, maybe two and a half years, uh, working on it off and on. The, uh, there's a lot of beading uh, and on this dress. And um, so toward the end of the, um, why I named it the Alice dress is, um, you know, we're all in this, this the finishing this collection uh, the summer of last year, we're in the, you know, in the um, worst part of, I guess, I guess I wouldn't say worst, but you know, one of the, the, the heaviest parts of the pandemic. And, um, you know, we're just every, I, I was missing home and missing uh, you know, my family and everything. And, and I live six, seven hours away from, from Gray Mountain, Arizona, which is just north of Flagstaff, about 40 miles. And um, so I'm missing my, my family, my grandparents, my grandmother, my paternal grandparents. And um, so I, did, I thought maybe, I've never really named my garments or you know, title them. Uh, it's usually like spring, summer, 20, whatever look to or something it's it's so much work trying to name everything every time so uh, that's usually the process i go with but um but this time i named this dress after my my maternal grandmother uh, my mother's mother her name is alice and um i named a couple of other dresses after um other grandmothers in my family um because in navajo we have our you know immediate um grandparents are maternal and paternal and then we have their siblings are also our grandparents and then um so um <clears throat> in any case then next so the uh, the inspiration for this actually comes from um my childhood like uh you stated in uh, my description um i spent a lot of time with my paternal grandparents uh their sheep ranch and we used to go to ceremonies and so this is how it's introduced into navajo you know deep into Navajo uh, uh, ceremony and culture. And um, I, so I, I haven't really done anything with that before. And when I started uh, designing clothes 10 years ago, 11 years ago now, or 10 years ago, and um, I really wasn't quite sure how to incorporate everything that, you know, I didn't know what I was gonna do, you know, how I was gonna go about doing things, but, um, what I really take from from my childhood growing up in those ceremonies is a the extravagance and the layers of um, of things that are done and things that are happening um, from like sand paintings, for instance, um, just one part. There's uh, the um, the paraphernalia. There's the people who are dressed um, in some really beautiful clothing, and then you have the songs, the prayers. Um, and so there are just uh, several layers going on all at once in this in this hogan in the middle of the night, mostly usually. And um, but so one of the things that um, I like to play with is transparency, um, and that kind of comes from my um, from a, a crystal gazing um, ceremony. I don't really like to go to a lot of depth about it, but it. It's about using moonlight, uh, starlight to um, shine a light through the crystal and through the songs and prayers. It, it reveals um, things to the uh, medicine man. And um, uh, I guess it, it was like, sort of like diagnoses uh, your ailments or whatever is bothering you. And so um, with that, I like to play a lot with uh, sheer fabrics. Um, and um, I remember, and so this dress is made of uh, tulle fabric, um, and then the beading is done on tulle as well. And so it's, it's very see-through. And the beading, the inspiration for the beading comes from um, uh, um, Mother Earth and Father Sky. And so um, you see on her shoulders, it, it has uh, black beads, which represents the, the stars and you know, the universe. And then down below is all flowers, and uh, which represents the um, the earth. And um, so we see from her, um, the hip area that goes up and it starts to um, kind of disappear and then go into the night sky. 
And so that's what the uh, inspiration for the dress uh, came about. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And um, it does seem, you know, to seeing these work side by side and Orlando hearing you talk more about uh, your Alice dress, you know, that there's these connections to place that there's, you know, these references to the cosmos too. Um, so it's, it's really exciting to see your works in direct dialogue like this to kind of show uh, some more parallels between them. Yeah, so I really love seeing uh, this, the, the Kara's uh, Hermosa image. I mean, um, it's such a beautiful image, it's so powerful. And um, uh, I just, it's, it's such a beautiful um, image. Thank you. Um, thank you both so much. And um, so I'm gonna move us to the next slide here. Um, so Kara, um, I was wondering if you could talk further about relationships to place um, in both of these works that are in the exhibition here at the museum? Um, relationship to place. I think I would go back to what I said during my first comment in that I think the forgotten things in um, American history discourse is that many of um, the industrial empires and the big cities that we uh, know of today, we don't think of as indigenous lands. You know, a lot of them we think of in these rural areas that are still pristine, um, but Los Angeles and many of the other big cities, um, including Las Vegas, where I'm from, are built on holy places. And Los Angeles is no different. Um, it is, uh, you know, absolutely a place of creation for Southern California peoples. And the history there um, in California is one of the most brutal colonial histories in the United States with multiple waves of, you know, genocidal colonialism coming in from the Spanish and the Mexican and then the gold um, rush of the mid 1800s. Uh, all of that to um, really bring us to uh, the image on the right, oil and gold, was a story that I wanted to tell, um, having spent time out there with uh, people that are Tongva descendants, um, and really knowing the history of California. I'm from a federally recognized tribe, but it's very common knowledge in California that so many of the tribes were never federally recognized, particularly in the state of California as part of that really sad US history. And you think about these things as a native person, but until you really go sit with the community and learn um, and talk story, uh, it kind of breaks your heart all over again. And the 19 tribes along the coast of California um, never received their federal recognition when the other tribes did um, because the, uh, not because of the federal government, but actually because the state senators um, hid the treaties and never ratified them. And it was by no coincidence that these were areas that were rich in gold and oil. And so um, while we were out there, you know, taking these beautiful photographs along the beach, it was really important for me to uh, try to tell the story of the displacement and the pain of um, non-federally recognized coastal tribes um, that don't have land base and don't have access and really have um, a, a very painful story. It's, you know, hard to describe. Um, but displaced for, you know, industry, which is an age old story in the United States, you know, from the gold in the Black Hills to hydroelectric energy flooding out tribes to the big largest solar grab in the Mojave Desert. Um, this is another one of those uh, environmental racism stories um, that, you know, displace the indigenous peoples of the US. So this is uh, taken in El Segundo in front of a Chevron refinery um, across the street because we were run off the property <laughs> trying to take the photograph. Um, 
uh, Leah Matafrawa again helped me. We all worked together um, on the regalia. One is dipped in oil and the other is dipped in gold. Wow. Oh, thank you so much for sharing all of that too. Um, and I, I did want to point out too that these two images that are in the exhibition, um, that they have a matte finish on them and there's no glass or plexiglass. So when you're in the galleries, these pieces, there's such a direct connection, you know, to anyone that spends some time with them. And, you know, you really start thinking more deeply about each one of these and the stories that they're telling and these these histories, you know, these very conflicted histories um, that are being shared. Um, and especially in oil and gold, I think, you know, what you've done here with capturing the light, you know, kind of in these different areas, and it kind of, it, it always points back to the figures. I think, you know, you can, you, it, your composition kind of continues to kind of bring, you know, a viewer's eye back to the figures to kind of consider, like, you know, how these different parts are working. Um, I was wondering if you wanted to talk a little more about um, how you landed on the gold on their hands and the oil on their hands and also on their uh, skirts. Um, what well, was really in conversation, um, you know, the, the pieces that I make are highly collaborative. So there's a lot of involvement with um, the models and, you know, oftentimes it becomes intergenerational, like with their moms, you know, because we're um, seeking, uh, you know, cultural approvals and making sure that we're telling stories appropriately on behalf of families. And then, you know, we're also representing communities. And um, we definitely wanted it to come through uh, this story of oil and gold. And uh, we really, you know, so many of my pieces are a group of, you know, friends and family playing with our imagination and figuring out how we're gonna tell a story. And, you know, my niece was, you know, gold leafing the shells and we're, you know, falling in love with it. And, you know, we're hand painting the shirts and, you know, coming up with more ideas in that part of the creative flow. So it was a group effort to um, put these, um, you know, put these outfits together and, uh, it was, you know, very hands-on with all five of us that were working on the project. Thank you. And um, Orlando, I was wondering also, you know, if you'd like to talk more about um, these two works um, in the exhibition, um, you know, maybe more about the process um, and concepts of the Red Collection work that's here on the left. Um. <clears throat> Yeah, this one is titled Red Collection and um, it, uh, well, for a while there and uh, here in Santa Fe, I was working um, at a gallery on Canyon Road. And, um, you know, being Navajo, I thought I knew um, a thing or two about Navajo textiles. Um, but once seeing all the, um, you know, just because of growing up with and around uh, weaving, um, but uh, there's a, um, a period when um, cochineal was uh, used, um, well, it kind of goes a lot further back than that, back to the um, um, Aztec and um, Inca, uh, the Inca period um, actually is when uh, they had um, cochineal farms. And when the Spaniards showed up, they somehow stole some uh, beetles and took them back to Spain and um, started cultivating their own cochineal farms. And pretty soon, uh, red spread all over the world. I mean, like the cochineal red, there was already different kinds of red that were um, um, available, but the cochineal beetle, uh, the red is derived from the female beetle and you can get some really, really bright, bright reds, really deep reds, and you can get anywhere from blush pink to black uh, just by adding different additives. And um, so I really love that concept of uh, Navajo uh, people taking um, Bayetta cloth from Italy, which was dyed in cochineal, 
and unraveling it and re-spinning it, spinning it into yarn to weave into wearing robes or clo uh, dresses. And so that just that little line of red or maybe the, the, the designs are in red of these um, old um, dresses of Navajo people. And so I took, I liked the red and then I'm, I had this uh, idea of, you know, with all the ruins here in um, the old villages here in, in the Southwest, like, um, like the really large one um, here in New Mexico. Uh, oh gosh, I can't even forget. I remember the name right now. <laughs> but um, Chaco? Uh, Chaco Canyon, yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. And um, so I imagine these like large cities um, and they were, uh, you know, they were um, women who were in charge. And so it's a matriarch, well, I, matriarchal is kind of, it's supposed to be both, but uh, like a, the society run by women and um, they, the women wore red dresses, you know, super elaborate. And, um, uh, and it was, it's really um, kind of cool because um, um, Kara's work with the, with the gold hands um, this is something that I had in mind with these dresses is um, uh, for uh, an editorial shoot. It's a lot of times I think about things as an editorial um, and then I, my collection kind of comes out from that. And so my idea was to have these women like you know, several women dressing in these red elaborate red gowns. I mean, like all these dresses are dyed in cochineal, by the way. Um, and uh, so like her hands were going to be dipped in gold you know so she'd be wearing gold and it would sort of be like makeup in a way but um just extravagance is what i was going for but also like um dipping the fingertips in red um with the gold and so these are the kind of images that pop into my head when i start thinking about uh what i'm going to do with the collection um and so these uh cities in the middle of the desert um you know, they rely a lot on water. And so um, there was, um, I forget the time period of um, uh, um, Pueblo um, um, pottery. And a lot of the symbols on the pottery are have to do with um, water in some way. And so I wanted to incorporate um, uh, just sort of my I, my versions of of what we all pray for in the in, you know out here for our crops for for living for life um and then also there's this mythical bird that they sort of um believe in and so i'm, I'm thinking about this whole civilization in my mind for this red collection and i only produce like just five pieces i believe for this collection but um they're all hand beaded um hand embroidered um hand dyed um sometimes there's a commercially red dyed fabric that it's overlaid on top of just to create a different um, uh, uh, effect with the when the fabric moves. And um, so yeah, that's kind of um, how that the, this uh, collection for the red collection came about. Thank you. Um, and uh, we do have a question um, of what the fiber of the fabric is in your red collection dress. Uh, they're silk. Uh, this one right here is a silk organza. Um, the beading and embroidery is done on silk organza. Um, and then I believe across the, the bodice, uh, it's lined with a, um, a silk uh, charmeuse, if I remember right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you know, while, while we're looking at these two works together to um, Orlando, I was wondering if you could talk somewhat about, about pose, you know, about, um, you know, the way that um, these women wear these dresses and um, kind of how you consider that, you know, in your process. And then, um, you know, once the works are complete. Um, a lot of times, this is one of the things that, um, is really, uh, I guess, gratifying, is that right word? Um, it, or satisfying is as a designer, I think, uh, for me anyway, it, it's the, um, when, a, when a model tries on a dress or a girl or woman tries on a dress, she sort of, she or automatically changes her posture, you know? So she, if she likes the dress and she likes the way she looks in it, 
she she automatically just kind of stands taller you know her shoulders are squared down and uh she just has a different way of standing and walking and looking at herself and you know walking in front of people so it's 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 them. It's not me that does it. You know, I, I make the dress in, in hopes that that it makes someone feel good. And um, and so when it comes to these two images, I wasn't there when it was being taken. So um, it's completely up to the model how she wants to pose. And I usually tell uh, the, the women who walk for me um, that I ask them first and foremost, if they're comfortable, are they okay wearing the dress? Are they okay with it? You know, so because I don't want to force somebody to wear a see-through dress if they're not comfortable wearing it, or maybe maybe that cut doesn't doesn't quite flatter a part, certain part of their body that they don't like. And I just want them to be comfortable when they're wearing it, even though they're just wearing it for the seven minutes on the runway, you know? Well, in some cases they're like 30 seconds down, up and down. Anyway, um, but the, for me, I think it's, it's, it's the, um, the person who's wearing the dress is who decides how the po how the pose should be, um, because they're ultimately the one in it. You know, it's the they're it's touching their body. It's um make, may, it's making them feel whatever they're putting out in in a photograph. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And um, and so I thought we'd also um look at some of your work, both of you um, from some earlier years. Um, and I'm just wondering, Kara, if you uh, would like to also address Pose, you know, how you're working with your collaborators and um, how that comes in kind of during the process. Well, to just add on to what Orlando was saying, um, you know, there are models that are just tremendously gifted also and um you know i work with both i love to find um beauty within our own community that we know exists um like you know just incredible beauty that doesn't um always get the visibility uh in the outside world and kind of you know elevating that through the language of photography um, pose is uh, so important, um, and I love looking at Orlando's pieces because they are so feminine, and I love hearing you talk about um, making the person feel good, because I think also um, that is something that we do within our community, is making sure that the person is feeling good, um, and I think that that might be unique to how we work with each other, that um, there's consent and collaboration and cooperation and making people feel beautiful. For me, that feels like it comes from a very maternal place um, when I work with my models. And I think two things, I think you can look at photographs, one, and say, okay, that was done by a non-Native person. Um, or that was, I can tell that that was done by a Native person. Maybe that's true with all of our art. And then I think with photography, you can also tell like that was done by a woman or somebody with, um, you know, a maternal or a feminine care, or that was done with male energy, you know, um, take, you know, male energy taking the photograph. Uh, so um, pose for me is uh, typically, you know, um, building, uh, a larger than life feeling for the person. And like Orlando, they're very editorial. So if you go through my portfolio, you'll see that they're named after the woman. Um, they're not named, you know, Santa Clara woman or Hopi woman or Dene woman. Um, they're named Ka and they're named Thai because the images are very much, um, the poses are also representative of who they are you know, working in collaboration with them. And nobody could make the Ka photo except for Ka, you know, and uh, same with Ty and Nikki and Naomi and, you know, the list goes on. So uh, I tend to shoot a lot because I don't um, feel uh, 
like tied to working with only like super gifted professional models. So a lot of times I will work with my friends and that takes a, a lot of work to um, just make sure that they're, you know, so happy with the way it renders on film or on digital um, at the end of the day. So it's uh, not uncommon for me to shoot hundreds and hundreds of photographs and we pick the one. <laughs> Oh wow! Wow, thanks. Yeah, I can pick. I can picture it now. Yeah, just looking through. Um, wow. Um, and would you like to tell us a little more about these two images, the concepts for both? Um, sure. So the one on the left, Ka, was inspired by um, a piece that appeared in a First American Art magazine, written by Rosemary Diaz about my husband, Diego and the mythos of clay woman, um, the deity of the clay here in the Southwest. And it resonated with me so much because we have, um, it was one of those things that you find intertribally of, oh, we have that story, you know, or, oh, there's something similar that in our mythos or in our star stories, that sort of thing. And it was this beautiful, the article started out with this just beautiful anecdote that Rosemary wrote about um, Clay Woman and how she was subtle and inviting and found the world over. Um, but when you went to fire her, no man could ever master her. And I thought, oh, wow, <laughs> like, isn't that how we feel about ourselves? And so I really wanted to um, photograph a contemporary a ceramic woman artist and show how um, the spirit of clay woman or how our mythos in general is passed down through thousands of years. And I'm particularly excited about ideas where um, we can kind of manifest these stories in contemporary times and we can be contemporary people and the mythos comes through time, you know, like just as strong. And uh, so this is Ka, we um, photographed her hair at one eight thousandth of a second. So we've captured motion through a special technique. And then um, in uh, what I call photo illustration or use of Photoshop, um, I've overlaid a second photograph on her skin um, in what's called a soft overlay um of a mesa verde vessel so we went back a little bit further to our common an ancestry um ancestral puebloan and we chose something from a long time ago and she's painted in clay from my reservation um a place called chalk cliffs and uh we shot over two days and this was the one <laughs> um like hermosa right you you know you see these ones and you're just like you know um and I think that happens with art when we make space for it. And then the one on the right is Thai. Um, I believe it was done in 2017 uh, with, um, I was working with the Native Art and Cultures Foundation uh, with the Mentor Fellowship. And I had an apprentice um, at the time, uh, Leah Kolakowski, who is an emerging photographer um, from Kinawa Bay, Ojibwe. And we were working on um, this idea of, of editorial and um, content in a portrait um, and in contemporary Native photography, what kind of stories are we trying to tell? And in this one, we really wanted to tell a story of Thai. And so there's, um, you know, an interview process with each of these people that I photograph, you know, where maybe I have an idea, but like, let's expand on it and make it about you. And like, let's bring in um, some ideas. And, and, and so um, I do some sketches and, you know, we kind of agree on some concepts and this is important. And for Ty, um, her mythos of white shell woman was really important to her. Um, and I had um, drawn out these, um, you know, four directional um, symbols that show up in Diné, you know, all through the Southwest. They're such powerful symbols, and she really liked that. 
And so I won't be too much longer. Sorry, Orlando. Um, I began to think about white shell women and I began to think about Chemehuevis as the desert traders and about how the tribes from the Southwest got their shells and their feathers were through these, you know, really intricate networks that were once, you know, probably, you know, incredibly enlivened. And so we thought let's enliven them. So I called Leah Mata who had married into the Pueblo and I said, do you have any Olivella shells? And she's like, as a matter of fact, I've been collecting them for 10 years. And so uh, Leah and I sat down um, and we kind of like fascinated on these old trade routes of her being Shumash and me being Chimuevi and Ty being Dene. And we sat down and we, clean, you know, we drilled and cleaned you know, hundreds of olivella shells and strung them around Ty's neck. Um, And then I went into um, the Shiprock Gallery and I had asked to borrow um, an antique blanket for the shoot. And there was this one that looked just like the drawing. And they were like, are you sure you don't want to look around some more? And I was like, no, I found it. (laughs) It was within just like a minute. So the blanket is from... Um, the 1920s, and that's the story of Ty. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Wow. Um, And we do have another question here. Um, So the question is, uh, I think for either of you who'd like to answer, um, when choosing fashion models, do either of you work with elders or those who are non-binary, two-spirit, or diverse body types? Um, Orlando, do you want to go first? Um, well, I usually don't, I think a lot of my designs are like the sizes that I use are based on my dress forms that I have because I drape everything. Um, but I don't have a preference for anything. I just, as long as uh, it the model works for the the garment, then that's how it goes. Um, A lot of what I do is also very custom. And um, if I was to make um, spends, I mean, some of the dresses can range from several weeks to several months to, um, you know, uh, a year, two years in the making before it's done. And, if I do a specific size for someone, you know, it's, it's hard to, it would be hard to sell it to someone or, you know, so it's, it's kind of a, a very um, difficult, I guess, process to, to find um, people to wear the clothes. Um, I mean, like I said, a lot of times they're only worn on the runway one time and um, then they're just sitting here in a box and, or sitting at the at a museum for an exhibition, um, but for me, I I don't have a preference, and I get a lot of like, especially when I show for for uh, Swaya's uh, fashion show, I get a lot of I get a little flack for um, for not having native models, all like every model being native. Um, but my thing is that the the clothes I make are for women, for all women. It doesn't matter where they come from, um, what their skin color is. It's is it's if if they feel like that's a garment that they would like to wear, then that's what they'll wear. And uh, um, I just never had the chance to work with, um, you know, I guess non-binary. Um, I have had um, inquiries. I just it's just everything takes a lot of time. So I don't know. Some people think that I put out dresses like every week or something and so it's it's a little you know it's a very slow process and things have happen um how they you know how they work um in time um but i'm i'm always open i'm a very open person um i like to work with a lot of people i really I feed off of their um i think their positive energy if uh someone doesn't if someone has a sort of a you don't you don't feel right about it then i don't work with the with that person um no matter how beautiful somebody is when you have like someone bad to you or you know just kind of puts out that bad energy you just don't want to work with them you know like 
Um, when I say beautiful, it's like they're they're like you know both like their physical beauty and then they're just they 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 lack something on the the inside and you just kind of don't want to work with them and um, I don't know it's I like I said I'm pretty open to to everything. I don't know if that really I, answers the question. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think it does. I think. Um, just to kind of reinforce um, what Orlando was saying, I do think um, we don't, for me, I don't always choose my models. Um, a lot of times it's more, it's far more relational. Um, and I love it when people say, will you photograph my daughter or will you photograph um, me again? And I end up working with the same group of people um over and over and over uh almost like a repertory so like my 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 theater of actors you know become different characters and tell different stories um i have not done a, a lot of work with elders um in more recent decades and i think that's because i'm not back home um i'm in santa fe and so um I think that uh, working intertribally in Santa Fe um, is a whole nother conversation um, about um, willingness and the whole concept of photography um, here in the Southwest. Um, there are just things, certain things um, intertribally that you don't photograph. And so I think that there's some sensitivity there uh, I think also a lot of my pieces are um, autobiographical. So I tend to tell a lot of stories of women, of strong women. Um, and so I am absolutely open to telling uh, more stories of non-binary and two-spirit um, when those stories come into my life and when those people come into my life and they're like, I want to be photographed. Um, and that for me is kind of a truth of, of who I am. Um, truth be, I'm actually very shy. Uh, and so I don't go out choosing models. Um, it's like really comes from a close uh, inner circle and still from a very shy place of, will you work with me on this? Um, I did uh, just um, finish a shoot with um, two spirit and non-binary and um, a pregnant mom. And so that's kind of exciting. Uh, if people are looking for that to show up for my work, I guess the answer would be um, yes, and uh, hope to do more. Yeah, yeah thank you. And um, great question to you. Um, and so Orlando, I wanted to ask if you'd like to talk more about these works um, so we can get to know a bit more about uh, your background and some of the different styles that you are um, incorporating into your practice. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, the well, I guess we'll start with the dress on the far left okay. on the screen. Um, the gray dress. Um, this was part of my um, 2019 Phoenix Fashion Week runway collection. I presented there. Um, this collection was this the one uh, both the, the both on the the two dresses on the on either side. On um, they're they're both from the same collection. Um, this one was based on like the inspiration came from you know back home. In Arizona, there's uh, these this area called the the Blue Hills, and they're volcanic ash hills. They're really beautiful. They have all these little um, uh, different layers of color, um, and it's all volcanic ash. And they're just they're just round, and like a lot of people uh, run their motorcycles and ATVs uh, up it and down it, and so they kind of messed it up the way it looks. Um, I haven't always say too much about that because my family's part of the ones destroying the look of it. But anyway, um, it's so beautiful to see um, the colors. They're green, like uh, gray, blue, gray. Um, 
And then, um, and then in, where Grey Mountain is situated in the Cameron, it's kind of in sort of in a valley, but then it opens up towards, uh, if you're going north, you're to the left is the Grand Canyon. And so if you follow the little Colorado River Gorge and you'll run right into the Grand Canyon and they kind of merge, right? And, um, but when you look across the valley um, across in the mesas on the east side of the valley, there it's sort of like the Painted Desert. If you ever seen images of the Painted Desert to have all these different colors. Um, and then, so those colors uh, from the uh, Blue Hills and from the mesas and then, um, you know, cactus flowers, um, uh, what are they called? Um, I forgot the name of the cactus, uh, prickly pear cactus. Prickly you know, when you're walking out in the, um, in the, um, in the, you know, out in the desert, you'll come across uh, uh, the cactus and you see these bright pink flowers where it's just like browns and reds and the the pinks just pop out at you and sometimes they're yellow and they're really bright golden yellow and I, i'm using that same motif again for this collection uh the the inspiration of the the yellow cactus flowers in um this coming collection but um so those colors that's where the color com uh color palette comes from is from those uh, the landscape uh inspiration and uh different um flowers and um plants um in, in the Southwest. Um, and so that, that's really kind of the base of the, the, the color palette. And um, like the one on the left there, it's, um, I like to work a lot with uh, some feathers um, because, you know, feathers are used in ceremonies. Um, they take your, you, um, uh, and they got sort of, for me, they represent like the smoke um, from a pipe when you smoke pipe or you burn cedar or sweet grass, you know, and you're praying, you know, the smoke takes your prayers up to, to, to the holy people. And so sort of that's kind of why I like to use it because the feathers represent the smoke in a way. Um, and so I, that's, those kinds of inspirations are very personal to me. So I don't really say a whole lot about it um, publicly, uh, exactly where the inspiration comes from because um, to some people, maybe it might be um, uh, offensive, I guess, um, taking something that's that um, personal to Diné people and, and putting it on a garment that is going to be worn by someone who's not Diné, you know, and so, but, but these are not, they're not direct um, representations of an actual ceremony. They're just the, the, the thoughts and the feelings uh, that are that I feel from remembering those times, and so um, um, and then uh, the whole front of the bodice is uh, beaded and it carries down into the skirt, um, and it was really most uh, this design was just the, the color palette again is based on what I told you before, but um, it's kind of like a party dress is what I was thinking for this dress, you know, just um, being able to move and so every time you kind of, somebody walks by you, the feathers move, you know? And so um, I just thought that there's constant movement and motion when you're wearing this dress. Um, and then like, I like, I really like um, pairing metal or metallics with, with my garments um, because silver um, to me represents um, white corn um, and then gold represents tkadadin, which is corn pollen. And so, uh, and those are two things that we pray with in the morning and the, the evening. Um, and so it's sort of like keeping within um, my traditional upbringing um, uh, of how you're supposed to present yourself to the holy people in the morning and in the evening. And so um, that's another reason why I chose special occasion wear to design um, and evening wear is because a lot of our ceremonies take place at night. Um, and then during the day, you know, you're supposed to get up in the morning, you offer your um, corn in the morning, and then you dress, you dress and you offer your corn because you, you want to present yourself um, ready to receive blessings. And so that is another, you know, when I talk about layers, um, when I talk about my inspirations and when I talk about Navajo ceremonies and cultures, it's just, there's so many layers. And so when I talk about my work, it, it 
seems like I ramble on and on, but it's because there's so many layers that are 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 thought of when I'm coming up with with a with a garment or with a collection because sometimes I only make one garment. It's not an entire collection, but that one garment has a uh, uh, has all these different things that are 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 thought about and um, wished, I guess, into the garment. Um, and so the one on the right um, with the purple feathers and the pink uh, skirt. Um, and then the pink part on the bodice is also dyed in cochineal. So, and it's hand pleated um, and the feathers go across the, 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 the upper part of the um, bust here and then over the shoulders and across the back. And um, again, the colors are, you know, co um, taken from the landscape and then from the flowers. Um, uh, and then also like I, it, prickly, prickly pear. I don't know if you've ever had uh, prickly pear margaritas. Um, <laughs> that <laughs> that's the color it reminds me of, and so <laughs> that's it's kind of fun. So um, I just I don't know. So uh, again, so the color of like something doing something every day, like going to the restaurant, and the bar, and ordering a margarita that's brightly colored, and there's this orchid sitting on top, and the orchid's purple, and and it's just it's so beautiful to see, and you get to hold it and get to drink it, you know. So. <laughs> Um, so that's kind of uh, the ideas for these, but I like um, I like things to be elegant. Um, I, I, I also like things that uh, make things where they they come in at the waist and flare out, or you know, um, um, I don't like it to be. Um, I, I just like elegance and um, and opulence, and so. Um, a lot of it does come from the ceremonies because when you dress up to go to these places, you wear the, your finest um, silk velvet blouse, um, uh, nice dress skirt, and then you wear all this jewelry and then you have your hair done and it's all nice and slick and, you know, so, and you're wearing all this jewelry and it's just, it's, it's such a beautiful sight. So I always remember those kinds of things when I'm doing um designs and things and one in the middle is uh from the red collection mm -hmm. and again all dyed in cochineal um and then uh there's a golden um that mythical bird that um that this civilization that i made up um sort of uh revered and um was a like a protection symbol and then right in this so it curls around itself like this so it's a Two, two birds and then right in the center of it there's an embroidered um, uh, floral uh, plant um, sort of to represent um, uh, new growth right and so because we're wishing for all this rain and um, so you you get to see the fruits of that um, uh, the prayers and stuff that that you've done and then again on her belt this is what I collaborated with a Zuni carver um, who uh, carved a, a belt, a buckle out of shell for me. And then I made the belt out of silver, I think, or was it gold? And, um, and that's how that came about. And um, so, and then I like to use a lot of um, crystals and beads to add sparkle. Um, again, that goes back to the stars. Um, so it kind of just, that's sort of re what it represents for me. So like, it's like laying a galaxy on your body in a way. Wow. Wow. Thank you so much for all those layers of, of details. I think those are such important insights and, um, wow. The last thing you said, the galaxy on your body, that's, that's very exciting. That's pretty amazing. Um, and we are at the top of the hour here. Um, so I do want to thank everyone uh, for joining us. Thank you, Orlando. Thank you, Kara, so much. Um, you both really just did an amazing job um, talking more about your practices. I appreciate um, you know you being here and um, you know working with us on the project. Um, so thank you, thank you, everyone, and I hope you have a great night. Thank you so much for having us, Orlando. It was so nice to share time and space with you. Thank you, everybody that joined us um, as participants on the Zoom. Yes. Thank you, Cara. It was very, very wonderful to, to speak with you. And Michelle, thank you. And everyone else who has uh, joined as well.
Well, thank you all. Um, hope you'll be able to come see the exhibition if you haven't yet. Uh, it does close um, this coming Saturday. Uh, well, have a great night and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.